but we are ready to get on our way. So Molweni and welcome Guninonke to the Nelson Mandela University's 12th Steve Biko Memorial Lecture, jointly hosted through the Azanian People's Organization, Azampo, and the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy, CANRAD. While many of us have gathered here today at the South Campus Auditorium in Summerstrand de Trebeja, we do have a number of people joining us via the live stream on the official Nelson Mandela University YouTube channel. A special welcome to those as well. Please feel free to engage with us through the live chat or on any of the university's social media pages. There's already a lot of conversation on social media with many of you sharing um, how important such a lecture is um, for today's South Africa. For example, Uluzu Gombumbulwane is saying that the annual Steve Biko Memorial Lecture is, and I quote, a learning experience to not be missed, umkhabulo or vital for all black people. The program promises just that. We will be having poetry items from Lele to Poetic Soul, the keynote from Prof. Janine, and the response from Prof. Seth Cooper. Um, there will also be an opportunity for everyone to be a part of the program um, when we are having the public discussion or the Q&A later on, just before we have the special vote of thanks from Azapo National Chairperson, Usim Piwehash. My name is Nobubele Puza, a lecturer at the Nelson Mandela University at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology under the New Generation Academics Program. My job today is simple. I'm here to hold together the program, Dipina Ditibani says some of the engagement that's happening here in the house and online. To officially welcome you to the lecture, I'd like to call up the Vice Chancellor of Nelson Mandela University, my Vice Chancellor, Professor Sibongile Mutwa. Thank you very much, uh, Nobubele, uh, for uh, looking after the program for today as the program director. Uh, I want to greet uh, our eminent keynote speaker, Professor Janine Tihira Geza. Uh, I want to greet Professor Seth Cooper, uh, the former Azapo president and a, a very well-known uh, scholar in psychology in our country. Um, I also want to um, recognize uh, Ngosina Tibiko, um, the founder and former chief executive officer of the Steve Biko Foundation. He is accompanied, I understand, by Mr. Don Laka, the musician who does not need any uh, introduction. He's one of the most talented musicians and composers uh, in our country, award-winning as well. I also want to recognize our Chair of Governing Council, Ambassador Nozipo January Badil, who is participating on this uh, uh, platform online, on this event online. Uh, I want to recognize uh, all members of the University Council that are here this evening. Uh, our academics, our management, uh, I've seen the Deputy Vice Chancellors of Nelson Mandela University, the Executive Deans of Faculty, the Professors, the members of Senate who have just been to Senate uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see some members of Senate here uh, this evening as well. I would like to um, recognize with a lot of respect uh, Mr. Simpiwe Hashe, uh, who is the national chairperson of Azapo, uh, Ms. Kekeleto Hena, uh, who is the deputy president. Yes. And then uh, Chris uh, Swepu, the secretary general of Azapo. Uh, and all the veterans who are here today and members of the Provincial Executive Committee uh, of Mzwandile, Mkoseli, Rijin, Soshanguve, KZN, and many others. Uh, I also want to recognize the members of the Bigo family. I'm going to name them because uh, we have been given their names. Uh, it is with a lot of respect that I welcome them. Uh, it's written here, Ukoesh, Makina, uh, and then Utrumani Makina, 
uthembela maqhina uchule kazi bula ubulelwa biko nonkosinathi biko whom i've already uh, mentioned i want to recognize our own resident poet and our alumnus ulele uh, tumahambehlala also known to us as poetic soul who has walked the road with us from inception and will render two poems uh, tonight. She is also the law graduate of our university, as I've said. Uh, the Nelson Mandela University students uh, led here this evening by the SRC president, uh, Uponso Shongwane, and other uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, student uh, structures uh, that are here and their leadership. I am told also that um, there are students from UKZN, from UNISA, from Rhodes, from Forte, from Vets that are participating here as well as from the University of Burundi. So we welcome all uh, the young people that are here. I've also been informed that uh, we have here this evening high school uh, students and teachers from Peterson, uh, Bethel Storp, Cohen, Westville, Newell, Chapman, Sakisizwe, Chetty, and Newtonic. Uh, community members and friends of Mandela University that are here, the citizens and the leadership uh, of all political parties uh, that are here uh, from our region and the members of government. I am informed that the MMC for sports, Pasi Kamana and five members of his executive committee are here this evening. I just want to welcome you all, including the ones that I've not mentioned by their names and their positions. You are all welcome at Nelson Mandela University this evening. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 2022 Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture. I am sure you all know that today is 45 years since Steve Bantumbigo was murdered on the 12th of September 1977. This annual memorial lecture is intended to commemorate his life and ideas, his teachings, his beliefs. His is a life that was so brutally snuffed out at the hands of then illegitimate apartheid regime. As the university, we are now in the 12th year of this annual lecture. And it has become one of the highlights, the red letter day of the university calendar. For this, I thank Conrad, and I thank uh, in particular uh, uh, Mr. Alan Zinn and his team. I thank the Bigo family. I thank uh, 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 Stephen Bantubigo's uh, organization uh, and, uh, and his movement. And then I also thank our previous eminent speakers and many of our collaborators and friends of our university that have made sure that this lecture lives. Nearly 30 years into our democracy, South Africa is still characterized by high levels of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Women still experience unacceptably high levels of gender-based violence and harm in this country. And of late, we have seen a troubling trend of Afrophobia targeting people from other African countries. All of this seems to suggest uh, that many people remain alienated and marginalized in South African society. The theme for the 2022 Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture, which says, Bigo lives building bridges among the wretched of the earth, is thus very appropriate and very opposite. 2022 also marks the fifth anniversary of the name change of our name from Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University to Nelson Mandela University. Since then, we have been on a journey to reposition our university as a socially embedded institution in the service of society. Traditionally, universities have three main mandates, as some of you might know, uh, that is learning and teaching, research, innovation, and internationalization, and engagement. As part of our endeavor to be a university in service of society, within our mandate as a higher education institution, we have significantly re vitalize our engagement work and are decisively recentering the scholarship and practice of engagement. To this end, we have pushed ourselves as the university to think through how we can mobilize 
our intellectual and other resources to contribute to resolving the pressing social challenges of the day and the kinds of relationships we need to build uh, with our communities. As Mandela University, we have recommitted ourselves to be the best expression of the African scholarly traditions. Public lectures such as this one are important to us in this, in this quest, not least because they stimulate intergenerational conversations as well. Hence, I am very proud to see a lot of students and scholars that are here this evening. In the South African context, Nearly three decades after we overcame formal apartheid, we need to ask the fundamental question of why we are still struggling to realize personal and patriotic actualization and affirmation for ourselves. The hope was that after almost three decades, we would have been able to cast off the chains of mental and physical oppression as Bigo so eloquently exhorted us to do. As we revisit Bigo's teachings and increase our self-reflexiveness, there must be conscious work to build spaces that are free from sexism, free from misogyny, and I would um, also excuse, want to say that we need to create an environment in which we send, uh, we, we need to destroy environments in which we center men over women. Collectively, our positioning should be unapologetic without needing to qualify blackness because to love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a for wanting the same for others. Being taught that, and I quote, a freedom from whiteness would not be achieved unless black people exercise the power to construct who they were and produce their own knowledge. I close quote, uh, this is uh, 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 the words of Bigo himself. So as we convene today, let us engage with the wisdoms that our speakers will share to carve out bold new imaginings steeped in the principles of Stephen Bantu Bigo and as explored in each of our memorial lectures in the past 12 to uh, 11 years. Let us recommit to strive collectively uh, for that radically humanist society, a more just, a more inclusive and humane world, uh, both uh, socially, economically and politically. As I conclude, Program Director, I would like to thank our keynote speaker again, uh, Professor Jeanine Tihi Rakeza and Prof. Seth Cooper, our respondent, for agreeing to share their wisdom with us this evening. Thank you too to Ngosinati Bigo for making time to join us this evening. Uh, we again thank the family and the foundation for allowing us to mobilize this name on issues of identity and issues of affirmation and in doing so to ponder uh, dilemmas that continue to stand in, in the way to achieving a truly humane society. Again, I want to extend my appreciation to the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at Nelson Mandela University for all the work in putting this uh, uh, memorial lecture together. Uh, I also want to thank again uh, uh, ASAPO, both uh, nationally and locally, in supporting us in our quest to be a socially engaged university. Our joint efforts have brought about the longest running Bigo Memorial uh, Lecture in South Africa. We trust that this will continue uh, in ways uh, that will make the impossible possible. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you so much to the Vice Chancellor of Nelson Mandela University, Prof. Sibongile Mutwa. And online, we do have um, a very engaged audience. We do have um, a lot of comments that are coming through from the YouTube live chat. I do encourage people to keep posting their questions, um, and we will try and read them throughout the program. 
At this juncture, I'd like to call up Ulele to Mahambesala, Poetic Soul, to render two items for us. want to welcome back Molwen. Can you welcome back? It's been two long years. Aren't we glad we to be breathing the same air with almost no anxiety? Yeah. The first piece I'm gonna do is called Through a Lot. And I know that as South Africans we're gonna relate to that being through a lot. The forced darkness sheds no load from our heavy hearts. Day zero quenches us of the very thought of thirst. Our months are longer than our salaries. Food prices taller than our hunger. Corruption, the new official language for the round bellied. And freedom, once a slippery soap, has become nothing but a figment of our imagination. South Africa. You have been through a lot. For the past two years, you've been holding your breath, chanting silent prayers, watching on as your children gasp for air, fighting for their next inhale. The windows to their souls displaying a desperate fear. Their smiles to their graves remaining hidden. Their loved ones at death posing the worst threat and dignified goodbyes, a risky luxury best left to wonder. He indeed escapes an empty As if the inexplicable must sit in audience to your progeny being washed away into lifelessness, their homes floating off with unlived dreams, families holding back their tears, too afraid to contribute even a droplet to the floods that leave many wanting, not wanting to admit that the beautiful ones might be dead, betting rather on the soothing belief that the beautiful ones are just missing, and the search still continues. South Africa, you have struggled enough. Enough for you to give it all up and surrender yourself to your fate. But as I stand at the balcony of your topmost floor, getting ready to take in the fresh breeze of the ocean and receive my good morning kiss from the rising sun, I'm a, I am amazed at the life you sound to my sightful ears. The whistling taxis, the roaring buses and the whispering trains, all painting songs of a country filled with endless possibilities. Back and forth your children ride with a new hope for something better to come. The domestics, the teachers and the nurses, the petrol attendants, the doctors and the waitrons, the physios, the police and the lawyers, the actors, the poets, the singers, the therapists, and the eager interns, all ready and willing to work and build this country up again and again and again. So one of the most important things that have ever happened in my life is to get the opportunity to perform at the annual Memorial Lecture Gustav Beek for the past 12 years at this venue. It has been an absolute pleasure. And that is because, and that is because it has fulfilled my lifelong dream of being able to once every year have a conversation with my hero. And this is another one of those conversations that I'm about to do. Sometimes I go to bed wishing for a dream where the two of us will be in conversation. If only for him to affirm that we're still on the right path on our way to true self-determination. I imagine myself walking up a golden stairway to the heavens where Steve and other greats gather and contemplate the state of our nation. With my presentation folded neatly under my arm, I am so ready to state our case and share with him our great successes. I want to tell him that we have finally made it, 
that we now sit at the same table as the white people and we share power with them for making decisions over the direction our country should take. But before I can press the play button on my mind, Umtina has already figured me out. And with a mischievous yet knowing smile, he turns to me and says, how many of you sit at the table? How many have been locked out? And how many have been discredited or killed to secure a place at this table? Furthermore, have you no wood of your own to build a table to your own specifications, one long enough to accommodate all of you? For how long shall you be satisfied with the invitation of a few who will no longer discredit your cries for their own immediate benefit? Do you not see, my dear child, that you are becoming like crabs in a bucket playing the survival game? And what pride must I show over your self-centeredness disguised with my people's real frustrations and need to reclaim their identity? But Steve, I spring up in response. Everything takes time. Our democracy is only 27 years old and we're only now getting to rip the fruits of the generation of learners that enjoyed and received the quality education of the whites. Now you see, therein lies our hope. With these children of the soil who have since elementary stood shoulder to shoulder with the whites. They, Tamela, they are not at all traumatized by what most in your generation have had to suffer. They are not scared of the white man. They are not intimidated by his fancy language. In fact, they speak it just as well, if not better than him. This young generation, they don't see color. All their matters are dealt with on the basis of merit and rationale. Now, if anybody can tell a good story about us, it's Generation X. At this point, I can only read approval on his face as he leans back, taking a moment to ponder these valid points I've just made. A regality in his stature as he rises to his feet tells me that my hero respects my opinion and is about to say, well done. But unexpectedly, a hearty belly laughter belts out of him and then more questions flow. This generation you speak of, Maskosan, them who speak the white man's language better than him, your hope, these children of the soil, are they as well versed in the language of their own people? And yes, they stood shoulder to shoulder with the whites, but on whose terms? Aren't these the same children who were fighting for the simple right to go to school as themselves with their natural black hair as their crowns? If I remember well, the whole country was at a standstill because being who we are is still a matter of political negotiation in our own land. And are you sure they don't see color? Because from where I stand, they seem to understand the color dynamics of our country better than the previous generation. I mean, these are the same people who have resorted to bleaching their skins to secure their positions in workplaces, in community, and in social circles. If you ask me, this is a generation that is desperate for reteachings of basics like black is beautiful. Or is that a mantra that died with me back in 77? You see, if you had built your own schools, these lessons of pride would have made it into your curriculum with ease. Now, that's where real power is hidden. True freedom begins in your hearts and mind and not in blindly following the thoughts and ideas of the same people who once blatantly oppressed you. But there you are, all at the station, waiting for the white man's train to deliver to you an education that you somehow believe, in spite of all that's been said and done, will be for your betterment. At this, I am defeated and deflated. I am now searching for anything that can save face. So I present him with evidence of my self-reading. I write what I like. I show him history of my research on black consciousness. I go as far as opening my social media pages for him, if only for him to see that I am woke. A loser's weak attempt at trying to get the approval of her hero. And as expected, he shakes his head in disappointment. His love and respect, though, strongly stamped and tattooed on his heart. My people, he says, the ones who need to be reading those woke updates, they can't even afford to walk the Twitter streets as you so refer to them. They are out in the real streets scraping away for tonight's supper. And you, being woke on your own, 
is of no value if it doesn't translate to the many everyday people who are out there dying from the abuse of drugs and alcohol, are suffering the indignity of being unseen and unheard, and are at the risk of becoming a motherless nation for the number of black women who are dying on a daily. Now, Maskosan, when you have it on your presentation that black men finally understand their role in society and agree with the importance of rebuilding the black family, worry not, I will walk into your dreams myself. But for now, here's a thing to remember. Steve Biko does not want you to recite I write what I like. All I want is for you to live your life in a way that does not delete your importance and place in the narration of our history. I want you to embrace each other, to show black love one to the other even in your weakest moments. I want you to realize my dream and find true freedom. You still have time, young girl. So go, live, and tell. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Lele, too, for uh, those items. I know that we have a standing ovation here in the room, but online as well, people are also um, encouraging the poetry and really feeling welcomed um, to the space through that rendition. I'd like to call up now uh, Poncho Songwane, who is the SRC president at Nelson Mandela University, and he is going to be introducing the speaker for today. Good evening to everyone. I thought perhaps maybe it would be a song, you know, yeah. so that we avoid this Eurocentric, you know, uh, kind of an engagement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's very important. You must always avoid this kind of, you know, we must always reaffirm our identity. We don't feel, you know, uh, uh, we must not be scared to be black. At any given time, when we're given an opportunity, we must always reaffirm that. Uh, my task today is very simple. I'm here to introduce the speaker, uh, uh, we have the pro uh, Professor Janine Ntihera Ngeza, who, who is the founding director for the Genocide and Human Rights Research in Africa and the Diaspora at the, North, at the Northeastern Ilioson University in Chicago, uh, where she is the professor and the TOSOL you know, program uh, coordinator. Professor Janine received her undergraduate degree in English and language and literature from the University of Burundi and studied uh, in the United States as a Fulbright uh, scholar obtaining an MA in the linguistic and from the Southern Lucian University, uh, Carbondale. She also has a PhD in linguistics uh, from the University of Chicago. Her current research is in African human rights, genocide, and refuge studies. She created uh, the, f the first oral history archive of the 1972 Burundi genocide, housing more than 100 uh, survivor stories collected in audio and video formats together with the transcriptions and translations. These testimonies will be hosted by the NEIU uh, Open Access Institutional Platform later this year. 
in collaboration with the University of uh, Southern California's OA Foundation and uh, Page University. Since 2013, Professor Janine uh, has served as a chair for Genocide and Human Rights Research Group at the NIU, uh, organizing conferences in genocide and human rights in Africa and the diaspora. She also, she also has presented as an, as an invited speaker at the genocide at the genocide conferences in the United States. Among other publications in 2021, they co-edited uh, the volume Critical Perspective on African Genocide, Memory, Silence, and Anti-Black uh, Political Violence, in which, in her own words, uh, I, I quote, open quote, Sevier's account of the 1972 Burundi genocide, close quote, appears. She is a, a survivor of the 1972 genocide in Burundi in which she lost her father and the older brother. Professor Chanin uh, is from a mixed family with a Hutu father and a Tutsi mother. In 2001, she received a human rights uh, grant from the University of Chicago to begin uh, working with the sub-Saharan refugee communities in Chicago. She has since initiated a number of community programs, uh, including a multilingual center, and has served as a principal investigator on the grants from the National Security Agency and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She also serves as the core lead of the community engagement core for the Chicago Cancer Your Health a quality collaborative uh, where she oversees community-based cancer education and outreach uh, designed for African immigrants. Uh, with those uh, words, I, I was uh, simply introducing you know, Prof. Janine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have, I have the energy. It's in. You've shared it. I feel it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful, warm welcome, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Nelson Mandela University, um, Professor Seth Cooper, the former Azapo president and uh, president of the Pan-African Association, uh, uh, African uh, Psychology, um, Professor, um, Bar uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Barney Pitiana, the founder of the Black Conscious Movement and Biko uh, Contemporary, and Mr. Nel Nelvis Kekema, as our poor president, my apology for the pronunciation of the names, um, and uh, Mr. Simpiwe Hashe, as a national uh, uh, chairman, uh, chairperson, and all other as a leadership. Let me make sure I, I have everybody. Um, and I'd like also then to um, 
recognize Mr. Nkosinati uh, Biko and other members of the, fam the Biko family, um, professors and staff, uh, students, distinguished pro uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and of course, if I forgot anybody, I would just say, as uh, someone just told me today, you can just say, all protocols observed. <laughs> All right, um, so I would like to, to express um, my deep gratitude for, of being, can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yes, I'd like to express my gratitude for being with you today. It means a lot to me to be present with people who know themselves and maybe those who are trying to know them, to get to know themselves. It's just wonderful. I had a chance to walk in the footprints of Steve Bantu Biko in the last two days and it was all transformative. I invite those of you who are out there who haven't done it, it's powerful. Do it. It brings change. So, um, it is indeed an honor and privilege to join the illustrious list of those who preceded me in delivering the Stephen Bantu Biko lecture. I was asked to address the topic of Biko lives um, building the bridges among the wretched of the earth. The wretched of the earth. Franz Fanon's words. Who are we? When I ask myself, who am I? Am I allowed to go all the way to answer the questions without anybody blocking me? Who am I? Am I able to find myself out there? Am I able to find myself here, there, yesterday, tomorrow? Am I? Who am I? Stephen Bantu Biko got us there. Have we picked up from where he left off? Would we say, as the wonderful poet said, would we be proud to say we made it? I don't think so. And today's conversation is about how do we do it? We bridge, we build the bridges. In Kirundi and Kinyagwanda, we say, izina nigyomontu, which means a person's name impacts who she or he becomes. Well, Bantu. In the, in the languages, in, um, in Ngosa, did I say it right? I tried. Um, the, uh, it means um, and this is really actually um, Nkosinati is the one uh, who shared this in one of the interviews that the name means the people's person. In Kirundi and Kinyagwanda it also means people. So Stephen Bantu Biko represented us all. It's not new, we already know it, but we want to work with it. He is, he represents people, Bantu. So I like to say the full name, Steve Bantu Biko, and it's more, even more rhythmic. So those who knew Biko said that uh, the name described him as Nkosinati Biko said, uh, who is of course the CEO, for those who don't know him, um, the CEO of Steve, the Steve Biko Foundation, and, um, and the eldest of because four children. Having been uh, uh, able to closely engage in his work and meet his contemporaries and family members, I can say Izina Nigyomondu. I've seen people talk about him. I've walked where he walked. I even went to the cell um, where he was, uh, when he was arrested, where he, he stayed, when he was arrested. Um, so telling about Stephen Bantu Biko and telling, telling about the black consciousness movement is telling about the life of people who still need to tell their stories, who, the story of agency, the story of resilience in oppression context. 
This is how Stephen Bantovico continues to live among us when we tell our stories, when we share our stories. Let me first share a, a quote from the 1984 Frank Talk editorial in the second volume, and I read, Biko lives. Two words slashed across a ghetto wall, a phrase that haunts the nights of South Africa's rulers. Reactionaries and opportunists of every stripe hope and pray that it will disappear under a rain of blood and the whitewash of reform. It, but it remains bold and powerful, not a tired and worn out slogan, but a battle cry of a generation whose hopes and aspirations are for revolution and the end of all exploitation and oppression. End of quote. So how do we end it, uh, all exploitation and oppression? The answer is we build bridges. And this is the end of the lecture. Let's go home. As Zambians say, if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, you run with others. So the answer is, let's join forces. You join, joining force, forces, inspiring each other, provides strength, courage, and resilience to keep, it, to keep at it. When you know that 99% of black people live in poverty, in the world, and more than 20 million Africans have been killed in less than 100 years to mass violence, producing more than 100 million survivors and numerous uh, refugees in the world. We cannot wait any longer to build bridges. There is a sense of urgency. Let's fight together. The more than 20 million lives lost to genocide and mass atrocities are from just six countries. Just six countries, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Namibia, Rwanda, Sudan, and Uganda. Numbers such as these are difficult to gather, particularly when perpetrators are in, still in power. So that's all I have for now, by hope. If there's a, a graduate student who wants to continue this job, to really figure out what the, how many people are we losing on a regular basis to mass violence, to genocide and mass violence. Um, but we, we, we need to keep going. We need to keep going. So um, these devastations leave behind deep wounds such as trauma, including generational trauma, so it doesn't end with those who, uh, who died and their survivors. Even if, uh, later generations suffer from that trauma. Uh, research has shown again and again that generational trauma is real and until it's dealt with, it cannot heal by itself. So if not uh, intentionally uh, healed, we get crippled. We become crippled individuals entire communities are affected. In addition to these wounds, continuous oppression, because it doesn't stop, continuous oppression undermines productivity. They say, well, they are lazy, they don't work. We're hurting, we carry wounds. How can we be productive? How can we pro pro participate in progress? Joining forces requires knowledge of self, knowledge of what happened, and knowledge of those who are going, undergoing the same thing. We need to know so that we can join forces. In order to build strong uh, bridges, one has to know self and also who the wretched of the earth are. Self-awareness promotes healing. If one inherits a garden full of weeds, no matter how healthy the seeds are, they cannot grow in such a garden. They will be choked up and die. 
I don't know if anybody has tried to grow anything in a, a field full of uh, weeds. Nothing comes out of it. So one has to be aware of the, the weeds, remove them, and proceed to fertilization. In other words, one has to be aware of the individual and collective trauma that has crippled generations for centuries. Until then, we have to start, and, and we have, and we have to start sharing our stories. We will build the kind of empathy that will engender the willingness to fight together with, with, with the common goal once we start telling, sharing our stories. So I'm going to start with my story. Are you ready? I didn't know I was black until I was 30 years old. Mm -hmm. You heard it, three zero. I didn't know I was black, seriously. You think, yep, that's the way it was. I was a, a new graduate student at, in the United States of America. Um, I wanted to buy actually a, an answering machine and uh, they, wouldn't give, they kept giving me a broken one and then when I returned for a third time with a friend, um, I, uh, they gave us, uh, gave us a working one. And because he was in front of me, he asked for it and um, they gave it to him. And also they were saying, may I help you, may I help you to him. I had gone twice, nobody said, may I help you, may I help you. So I asked him, how come they are asking you to, to, they want to help you, but they didn't, and then they gave me a, a broken machine twice. And he looked at me and said, because he could say, we were friends, so I could say it. He said, Janine, you're black. And I, oh, no, I was a new student in America, and uh, I had read all about the suffering, the plight of black people in South Africa, in America, everywhere. But that wasn't relevant to my life in Burundi. There was something very serious, utterly wrong. It wasn't about blackness and whiteness. It was being Hutu or Tutsi. That's what I was carrying. I was running and running because I hadn't been allowed to talk about my Hutuness, to talk about what happened to my father, to my, my brother. No, I was still running and running. Now I'm in America, freedom. Oh no, I'm black. I found out. So had, I had read all of that in books but being black did not become relevant to my life until that day. Did I awake that day? No, I can't really much go on. There was a dream to chase. But things kept happening. I come back to how I came to realize that I need to wake up and act. So um, then I wondered how many people through time, I wonder how many people who are oppressed who are out there and don't even realize how oppressed they are. How many out there don't want to face the root cause of their oppression? Because they are scared. They are wounded and they are scared. Many of us, I was one of those. And actually, I'm still, I still I am. I knew I was among the wretched of the earth by being a Hutu in Burundi at that time. This was in 1991, by the way. And so, who are the wretched of the earth? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the wretched of the earth as deeply affect, afflicted, dejected, or depressed, contemptible, inferior. I, if you had seen what I wrote here in capital letters, inferior. The oppressed are not responsible for being wretched. Someone did it to them. Their realiza this realization should bring those in these conditions to fight together, to unite in order to achieve true mental and systemic liberation, mental liberation, as Steve Bantubiko would want us to do. 
All those who suffer longing for justice, freedom, and peace ought to fight in unison. For this to happen, we have to know each other. We have to know the stories of, of each other. We have to know what's in the curriculum. Have you checked recently, since the last time you were in elementary school? What's in there? Has anything changed? Paolo Freire defines critical consciousness as the ability to intervene in reality in order to change it. Are we revisiting the curriculum to change it? We need to question everything. We need to, write, to use the right names. We need to become aware of the condition we are in and being able to do something about it is key. Stephen Bantu, because of consciousness, was not passive, it, it was active and he lost life for it. His achievements in his short 30 years, remember? He was a kid when he was 30 years. I was trying to find my, I didn't even know who I was at 30 years of age. He inspires us all. He certainly has inspired me big time. Okay. So the next two slides are quite disturbing, so bear with me, I'll be quick with them. This is Congo, Democratic Republic Congo under Leopold, King Leopold II. More than 10 million lives killed earlier on between 1885 and 1908. More than 6 million recent, more recently between 1996 and 2010. If you didn't know about that, you are, you are not alone. Well, that's a big country. Let's take a little country, Burundi. 1972, genocide strikes. Tutsis killing Hutu. Don't confuse Rwanda. So in Rwanda, Hutus were a majority and were, um, killed the Tutsis in the genocide, at least majority. Um, and they in majority in these numbers. I'm just going to use majority. Um, and then in Burundi, the Hutus were majority also, but the Tutsis killed the Hutus. So it's the reverse of the Rwanda situation. But the perpetrators, the regime in Burundi, denied it, silenced everyone. We couldn't talk about it. Recently, 19, in, in 2022, 2021, guess what? There you see. So I'll move from it so we don't get um, caught up in these images. I apologize for those of you who it may have um, affected. So, we couldn't talk about it. So you have a giant Democratic Republic of Congo, millions of people dying. In Burundi, and in Burundi, it was the 1972 genocide, it was the first genocide post independence. Okay? But nobody, I mean, if you've never heard of it, you're not the only one, I can assure you, because the government managed to silence inside and outside. I'll come back to that later. But the fact that nothing happened to that general, nobody, there's impunity, not, it wasn't talked about, guess what happened? Cycle of violence. If you don't deal with it, it happens again and again. So year after year, five years, 10 years, and until recently, genocide, mass atrocities kept happening. Now, did we mourn? Did we, um, um, uh, were we allowed public mourning? No, that wasn't even an option. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. So, it was, there was no mourning. Then in 2019, I traveled to Burundi um, to visit. The same summer, I went to Cambodia. So in Burundi, 2019, there was a, remember, so we lost about 200,000, more than, I'm sorry, more than 3,000 people were killed, and they were only Hutu elite men in Burundi. Guess what? In 2019, there was nothing, no memorialization, you don't talk about it, people are still whispering. I traveled the same summer to Cambodia, and I found 
they've not only memorized, that they remember their loved ones, that they lost, the survivors made sure that there is detail about that genocide. They marked even the bones, marked, this one was died, there was a, um, um, a hammer, this one died, uh, they used a hammer. They used, so they have detail about how these people died. That's how much they valued the memorization because they were allowed to, they could. In Burundi, it was zero. There was nothing you couldn't tell at that time. But then, of course, you just saw the slide before how they end up, um, they went through cycles of violence because they didn't recognize the evil. Okay, so now, uh, all right, there you go. So I'm going to pause on this slide. So this looks almost like a, a silly slide, okay? But colonization not only took material goods, but it infiltrated the minds through formal education, the ways we dress, the way we sing. We, we heard our, our poet, how she represented that. And the languages we adopted, the names we adopted, the, and the example here, of tarot roots. Tarot roots actually is a, uh, the, the translation, I don't know if it does justice, but in Kirundi and Kinyagwanda we call them amateke. Okay? And the amateke are just Burundian, Rwandan uh, roots that we eat on a regular basis, right? But to name them, to show the, which one is better quality than the other, one is amateke yikirundi. And amateke yiki zungu. So some of you know muzungu, white, right? The word for white in Kiswahili and in Kirundi. So amateke yiki zungu, oh, the words shifted. I, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Uh, it's supposed to be, let's see if I can. Uh, okay, so the left, uh, go back. Okay, all right. Okay, so the ones actually on the right, on the left are the uh, Matekiki Zungu, and the ones on the right are the uh, Matekiki Rundi. So because of quality, so it's a beautiful, it's a Viki Zungu, um, 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 white, and then Kirundi. So just, this looks like a simple, small example, but that's how deep colonization has got to us. Um, and... Uh, so how do we get rid of, how do we take out um, that such influence? But, so this is an indicative of how badly colonized our African knowledge system is. Um, we know that if even a black person becomes rich and looks good, they say you've become umuzungu, you've become white. Um, so we cannot, we cannot liberate our minds what Steve Biko, Bantu Biko asks of us until we remove weeds from the garden. A formal education, especially through boarding schools, let me check the time, um, tore the Ubuntu humanity fabric. While people physically, uh, while, while white um, people physically left, or in this case in South Africa stayed, their cultures remained with us, ingrained in everything we do, everything we say, everything we think about, it's all there. The demeaning language is still there. We haven't managed to kill, clean it up. And most importantly, they left us with the deep wounds. They left the Ubuntu torn. How are we going to mend it? It's the only way we can bring our hands together to build bridges. It continued to be torn as new leaders continued to implement the divide and rule policy of the colonizers. The population got doubly wounded first from colonization and then from ethnic strife that led to genocide in countries like Rwanda and Burundi. So many of you have heard of Hutus and Tutsis and sometimes they are difficult to, talk, to pronounce. And in the Great Lakes of Africa, Burundi, Rwanda, Democratic Republic, and with influence, refugees are now all over, including uh, South Africa, who fled running from um, 
the, the genocide, and genocides really, because there were many um, through time. So why in the 70s, why Steve Bantubiko and his contemporaries were fighting for freedom in South Africa, leading to the creation of the black consciousness movement, subhuman characteristics were imprinted on the Hutu minds in Burundi. So now I'm coming back to that, to the genocide, 1972 genocide in Burundi by the Tutsi regime. Segregation was implemented in various systems, education, judiciary, army, and many other areas in the country. Hutus didn't have access to the prestigious positions. I didn't know I was Hutu until I was 13 years old. So I didn't know I was black until I was 33, and I didn't know I was Hutu until I was 13 years old. And you may wonder, what did I think I was? Well, Hutu Tutsi is not like being Zulu or Osa uh, or um, Swazi. No, it's, it was imposed. These two terms, yes, they are Burundi and they are Kirundi. They are part of their words in Kirundi, but they were picked up as what they could use with the colonizers, Belgians, uh, uh, Germans. They picked up those words because, and used them to divide us. So if you had a straight nose, they would measure the nose, and kind of narrow, you are Tutsi. If you have a flat nose, you are Hutu. Done. Go on, keep on, keep going. So people call these ethnic groups. These were imposed words, categories, that we did not buy into. That's why I didn't know I was Hutu. If you had asked, uh, if you ask a Burundian when they got to know, actually I've been uh, running uh, interviews, collecting stories, genocide stories, uh, testimonies, and I, one of the questions is, when did you get to know you were Hutu or you were Tutsi? And they all pointed to around 1972. That tells you that this was all socially, a social construct to divide and rule. Um, so, the, uh, the, um, let me go back to my text, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, so, my Tutsi, so at that time, so how did I get to know? Because a, a, a classmate revealed to me um, that I was Hutu and that my father was killed because he was Hutu. I had no idea, I thought, he, actually they had told me he had fled, he, had, he was in Tanzania. So, I was still waiting for him uh, two years in. Um, but I had no idea he had been killed because he was Hutu. And also I learned that my mother was Tutsi. I was in a boarding school in the seventh grade waiting to go home to ask her why in the world she didn't choose to be Tutsi, Hutu like us, like my father and me. So from that time on, I was told that I didn't have to write to the air. So little girls and boys, Tutsi, would come and say, stop breathing. And because we had large noses and they would finish all the air. So they didn't want us to. <laughs> yeah. So it is still bugs my mind that the first genocide in post-independence Africa was so successfully denied and silenced. 50 years later, more than four mass graves, as you saw in one of the slides, 4,000 mass graves have found in this tiny little country in Burundi. Um, and who is managing this state of affairs? This, these are the orphans of 1972 who are dealing with the bones of their lost ones. And every time, of course, we see a bunch of bones, we say, could that be my, is my father there, my brother there? My, so we're constantly looking at those bones, not knowing what to do. And we, have, we don't have the technology to find out who those bones belong to, which family has their, those. Maybe they are in, the, in Lake Tanganyika also, so we, have, we never know. And so the collection of testimonies 
says it all. Men and women in their 60s, 70s, 80s break down crying for the first time because they are sharing, they are allowed to share their stories publicly. Um, so those were the children, you know, they were orphans, they were uh, children in 1972, and now they are allowed to pub publicly mourn their loved ones for the first time. So it's quite powerful when I'm, I'm listening to these stories, um, when I collect them. And so now we can only build bridges, because once the silence, uh, we, we have to know who we are. Uh, because once the silence was imposed by the Tutsi-dominated uh, government, um, the, Burundians, the Burian, Burundian authority did not, uh, combined with our culture in Burundi, in Kirundi especially, uh, the, we are not allowed to talk about the dead. Uh, it, it, we, if you say you talk about someone, or if you're referring to where someone used to live, you say where um, the 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 person who left. So depending on the context, so you can't say their names because you're stopping them from resting. So the authority used the culture to really silence everyone, everywhere. Okay, so we can only build strong bridges if we aim to heal together uh, through relationships and meaningful uh, connections. Um, so we can only uh, build bridges if we realize, recognize, and respond, and resist to re-traumatization. And not just in silos, but together. Again, by listening to each other's stories. We can build bridges by creating conditions that create safety, a sense of safety that reduces uncertainty and create predictable structures. We can build bridges and succeed if we memorialize what happened to the oppressed for healing's sake and to promote critical conscientization. Often times, the oppressed tend to inherit memorialization of the oppressor's events with no room for memorialization of what happened to them. The lost lives are not memorialized. We tend to inherit those structures, those monuments, those place, spaces created by the oppressor without space for our, our own. And more importantly, without space for our own knowledge, African knowledge, that's absolutely amazing. In such situations, survivors can never heal fully. So remembering in order to heal, part of the consciousness is to become aware of what happened to us, the pain that, caused, uh, that was caused on us. Black Pride, promoted by Steve Bantubiko, a great example of memorialization, is there for us to use. The challenge is to find ways to harness memory, to learn the lessons from the past in, effort, in an effort to avoid repeating it. Without a proper engagement with the past, and with institutionalization of remembrance, societies are condemned to repeat it, to repeat, reenact, and relieve the, the horrors. Forgetting is not a good strategy for societies transiting, transiting into a minimally decent condition. And this was uh, presented by Bagarva, um, one of the authors who work a lot on memorialization. Promoting interconnectedness can build bridges to lead to strong unity. I witnessed the building bridges, what building bridges look like when I participated in Steve Bantu because annual memorial activities um, where President Nevis Kekema, who is here with us today, uh, the president of Azania People's Organization, Azapo, and um, President Mwanele um, Nyoto uh, of Pan-African Congress, how they brought together their organizations to celebrate this special event. The outcome was a rich sharing of thoughts, of ideas, and lots of singing and dancing. And I can only imagine the day after, the days after, the months, the years after, if they keep working together, what could happen? an example of building bridges. 
allowing social movements to connect with those on the surface may appear to have little in common with those who may have, uh, look like they don't have much in common, but we all know in, as in Kirundi, those who speak Kirundi, umundu uh, nuwundi. And I think those also who speak the Nguni languages may hear umundu nuwundi. Which means the personhood of a person is made whole by the existence of another person. In other words, alone we are inevitably incomplete. We are broken even. And when we break, nobody's there to pick us up alone. But if we are doing it together, umuntu nuwundi. We make each other whole. Ubuntu is a part of African heritage. It is not perfect, we know that. We can, we can keep building it, but we have to mend it so that we can use it as a tool that can not just be shared among us, among Africans, but import in the world. We've been, we are importing democracy which is not her inherited. We inherited a tool, an incredible tool, Ubuntu, a way of life. But we ha so we have to keep working on it. We have, it, is, it is almost universally acknowledged that in order to get the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. So if we ask how we're going to use Ubuntu, we start small. We start one by one, and we build it, and we build it. We start in education, in the curriculum, and I keep repeating curriculum because I'm also in the business of education. What we put in there is so important. It influences our students, our youth, the future leaders of our countries. So it's important that we train them to ask questions. We ask, we don't ask, we, we, what can be done? We ask what can be done rather than what's wrong. So umutkwen um, um is another proverb in Kirundi that where we say one head cannot advise itself. Umutwe we get inam. So and of course this way we uh, the Lord is lighter when we are connected when we are working together. So there's a lot that's been published about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a home here. Uh, there's so much work that's been done already. There are centres that build around Ubuntu. So but Africa this way of life which favors communalism above individualism, which is a code of trust so that suffering of one is conceived as the suffering of all will get us there, will help us build those bridges. And it is because it strives for harmony and security offered by the group and self-sacrifice by individuals for the larger group. So I'm going to end with a, a quote. Oh, I had this slide to show. This is my mother who modeled how you build bridges. And I'll, I'll take time, let's see, do I have time? Yeah, let me share this story. So um, my mother Tutsi, I'm Hutu because my father was Hutu, so she was married to a Hutu. When she when was growing up as kids, among neighbors, people didn't like to hear to, to share a meal with Batwa people. It's horrible, yes I know, but that's the way it was. So we were Hutu, Tutsi, Twa. The Batwa people are like 1% of the population, but they were just like the minority of minorities in every sense of it, and so they didn't have access to much. So when they came to sell pots, that they, the clay pots that they, uh, they made themselves, we would feed them, they would usually have their own plate and leave, we eat in a corner, that's what I observed in the, in the neighborhood. But my mother would say, uh-uh. So we would sit down and she give this platter full of food and we'd sit down to eat. And when the, uh, the Mutua person would come, we would start going like, uh, like almost being uncomfortable and our mother would just give us that look, you know. I don't know if you remember that look. And we know to not to just eat with this way. And she'd say, Abatwa Nabandu. Twa people are also humans. So she taught us to eat with them. There's no um, 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 putting down other people. So also she shared with us, so when we had this concept, I don't have time to go deep into it, uh, Hutu, there was, this word Hutu of course existed, and if, some, if I gave you a cow, and you become my Hutu. 
And so you'll be giving me some gestures to say thank you every so often because I gave you a cow, a cow gives milk, it gives manure and all of that. So my mother, we had a Hutu, even if my father was a Hutu, but he had a Hutu. So when he um, died, my mother told this family to stop bringing the food, said, go take care of your family. It was a system of gushikana. Go take care of your family. That's really, so those two examples showed how she uh, modeled what it is like to work for social justice. Um, so I will end with this quote. Um, first I read a short poem and then I'll end with this quote. Um, there is no greater power than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible and not what's wrong. Keep asking. Notice what um, you care about. So notice uh, what you care about. Now I got my pages mixed up. Okay. So, um, you know what? Yeah, I put them down and, all right, that's okay. So, I assume, assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people who you never talk to. Build those bridges. And my last quote is one um, where Obama, uh, President Obama, former President Obama, on his meeting with Pope Francis, he said, I think the theme of, of that stitched our conversation together was a belief that in politics and in life, the quality of empathy, the ability to stand in somebody's else's, to somebody else's shoes and to care for someone, even if they don't look like you and, or talk like you, and, or share your philosophy, that's critical. And that's what we should be doing to, to um, be together. So I will stop here because I ran out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I can take a seat on the couches. Oh. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof, for such a, a thought-provoking address. And it's already sparking a lot of engagement online as well. I'm not going to read the questions now, but already um, Dr. Jody Mikalaki, already from Burundi, who's engaging with your address, um, will also tackle Dr. Khape's question as well um, and Dr. Zondi's uh, questions that are appearing online. But to do the official response to the address, I would like to call up Prof. Sats Cooper, who is the president of the Pan-African Pan Psychology Union and the former Azapo president. It is my singular honor and pleasure to make a few remarks on what was a deeply thought-provoking and relevant discussion in the third decade of the 21st century. We have tended to follow narratives that are routinely given to us. And during the pandemic, where we've looked inwards, where we've been influenced by bots on social media, we have tended to become individual and follow trends. And many of those trends are antithetical to our own essence. And that is the gist of what this wonderful presentation has been. Very torturing, raising issues of deep trauma, intergenerational trauma, uh, something that some of us 
look at but which often gets ignored in the larger scheme of things because it is unpopular. We cannot acknowledge trauma. We cannot acknowledge the pain of memories that get transmitted directly and indirectly and which I think in this country, not merely in the Central African region that our keynote speaker has been talking about. How else can we respond to the issues of unmitigating violence that we perpetrate on ourselves and unto others? This insight of the colonial conquest and how our minds have been shaped by the colonizers, how our education system indeed is deeply colonial, except in a few institutions like this one where the boundaries are being challenged. Indeed, after the roads must fall movement and the quest for a curriculum change, you'll find that those leading decolonization are Westerners or trained in the West and ignoring our essential condition. But let me point to the opening words. Who are we? Who am I? If we can answer that question without reference to colonial constructs, the categories we use and still keep on our statutes. We just had a census about a month ago. And those categories changed over time are still used in our country. If you can answer the question, who am I without referring to a language, a belief, an ethnicity, then you're on the path to rediscovering yourself. I know 28 years after democracy, it's not fashionable to refer to quintessential blackness. But without referring to that quintessential blackness, our own sense of humanity has to be impugned. If we read our media, if we look at our media, we'll be forgiven for thinking that we're anywhere else but on the southern tip of Africa, not of Europe, not of Asia, not of anywhere in the global north. And that is part of what we have to confront as a society. You referred to, we still need to tell our stories. And it's become totally unfashionable for people to reflect on themselves and their experiences. You see, the big mistake was that in the Mandela presidency, we had the quest for reconciliation, which was important given where we've come from. But forgiving and forgetting is part of that problem. And you pointed very carefully to not forgetting. Because remembering, as the Nobel laureate said, um, the divine retribution of memory. The divine retribution of memory is something that can come through unearthing ourselves through our stories, our trauma. We are a wounded nation. Indeed, we're a wounded continent. And where did we start? the Berlin West Africa Conference, also called the Congo River Basin Congress, 
which the German Chancellor convened 15th November 1884 to the 28th of February 1885, where Leopold played a ma major role. It was actually to control Leopold in the Congo River Basin. And the story you've heard of Burundi is at the heart of it. What Leopold has done, the ghosts of Leopold tell a tragic but unrecognized story of mayhem created and part of it is the Hutu Tutsi experience. But we still confront chattel slavery, which we still confront extractive economies, and Africa is rich. The DRC, the richest, South Africa second in mineral wealth, but amongst the poorest in the world. And how do we get there? We get there because our leaders have been subverted to believe in the narrative of the past. I can quote certain uh, words that Steve Biko wrote about. But let me just avoid that and deal with these countries, there were six, 14 of them, Austria, Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Sweden, Norway, because Sweden controlled Norway then, Turkey, the United States. All these countries were part of the Berlin Congress and they carved out Africa for themselves. They still carving out Africa for themselves. And how long will that continue? As long as we tolerate it and as long as we allow it. That's why the stats tell us we are the least employed. We are the most unemployed, and yet all around us, there's wealth. But for, at the rendezvous of victory in 1994, unfortunately, with a few notable exceptions, we had half human beings lead us, who still believed in white and non-white. Because you see, when you remove the term white from that construct of non-white. You are left with non, nihil, nothing, a negative. What I call a thing, reif, a reification from the Latin word reus, where nearly all of us have been objectified. Objectified, made invisible, and yet with a majority. Who is visible? Who is that epitome of beauty? Those questions are deep questions and we tend to ignore them. Our education system has tended to dumb us down and tended to not ask the questions that you are asking that we must critically ask. Who am I? Who are we? And can we be in the same journey together? So, I am deeply affected by what I've heard, I'm sure many of you are as well. And as you say, forgetting is not a good strategy. There are imposed constructs on us, and that leads to what many scholars call epistemic violence. Besides the sheer violence of abuse, verbal, psychological, and physical, there's epistemic violence which denudes indigenous and other knowledge systems. 
which actually says that is bad versus this is good. I'm glad you referred to communalism because and one of the founders of black consciousness is here, Bani Pichana. When we talked of black, it was looked at as, why are you doing this? Why are you racializing something which ought not to be racialized? We should stand for non-racialism, and we agreed. However, the term black was deliberately chosen because of its negative connotations. It's a black day. The clouds are black. Black is ponderous. And d the decision to turn it around into a positive, and you mentioned black is beautiful. And a lot of people, especially after the Black Lives Matter uh, resurrection with George Floyd's murder in 2020, also started saying, Everyone is beautiful. Yes, that's true. All human beings are beautiful. However, in the, we need to be contextual about this. And when, on an unremitting basis, daily, the images, the words continue to negate us, to deride us, and to dehumanize us, our ability to respond as equal human beings is not there. So as I said, at the rendezvous of victory, we had half human beings. So what do we expect them to do? And it's interesting that this morning, President Ramaphosa, as the president of the ANC, wrote in his column about Biko. It's important, and I, I want to acknowledge that uh, he was the chairperson of SASO, the South African Students' Organization of which Bani Pichana was uh, the second president and the first secretary general on a full-time basis, that he actually talked of and, and eulogized Steve Biko, but he also referred to the state of unemployment, the state of misery in this country. 28 years after democracy, a president of a democratic South Africa is bemoaning the stats that he's presided over. <laughs> that surely cannot be correct. It seems like we're in a dystopia You know, because if you're in charge, there should be change. If you're in charge, there ought to be something different. And that difference can come through a restoring of our basic humanity. And that, I think, is the powerful message you have left us with. And for that, I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you so much um, for that response, Prof. And I think it's a great entry point um, to the open discussion that we were hoping to have. And I think I might have misrepresented it when I say an open public discussion, um, because unfortunately we do have quite limited time, especially for our online audience. So I do want to be fair, and I don't want to stifle the engagement today. But I'm going to ask for one or two people who have a burning question um, in the audience in the room today at South Campus Auditorium. And I do have um, three questions that are coming from online, but I think we can really sum them up in one critical question, so we'll do that. So I just want to test here in the room, hands for two people that have a burning question. And I know that we need to clarify what a question is sometimes when people have been so moved by such a beautiful uh, presentation. 
okay, I see one. I do have lights in front of me, so you'll forgive me if I miss our learners. If there's a question coming from the learners, a thought, um, clarity that you might want to ask. I'm just going to ask if Ntlara Nipo can assist me to, to check if there's a hand from our group of learners that are coming in. Okay. All right. So if there aren't any questions from the learners, I have seen the first two hands. That will be a third hand if I take yours, and I don't want to cheat the system. I said one, two. If I say three, there'll be a number four. So I'm going to be strict on this, and I'm just going to take the hand that I saw here first, and I'll take the second hand that I saw here. All right, please uh, forgive me. I do have to wear devil horns sometimes, classy, class my bay program. All right. Good evening to our speaker, our guest speaker, and to the audience. My question is, in terms of the sharing of these stories, that you are talking about the sharing of our collective past, our struggles, our pain that was inflicted over centuries, starting going as back as 500, where the Muslims invaded North Africa first, even going as further back as when Egyptian civilization's ideas were stolen and appropriated by our northerners there with the white skins. So we can go far back, but now we find ourselves in the industrial revolution where our technology has changed to such an extent that the it's been- The question please, sir, I'm really sorry. Our the technology question. is being controlled where we can uh, share these stories with a higher pace but yet we must do it in these platforms. How can we then continue to do as you are saying in terms of building these bridges so that we can totally liberate ourselves as Africans? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, the second question will follow suit. The second question was here. All right, we'll skip that second question. We'll go to the question that was number three, which is now number two, and no other questions. <laughs> At the moment, colleagues, please. We'll get a microphone to you, please. Just be patient. And while we get that microphone to you, um, I'm just going to point out the questions that are coming through online. And I think they really will tie in with the previous speaker's question at the moment where a lot of people online, Dr. Jody Mikalaki, um, Apiwe Magaya as well, and a lot of people that are agreeing with um, Apiwe and Jody, around how we build bridges then um, between African nations and societies. And this is a conversation that's coming particularly um, given the, the issue of xenophobic violence in South Africa in the recent history. Oh, um, thank you, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'll start by introducing my name, Ikamalam Nungutan, Senim Gusoka. My question is, does the system we are governed under work for the black people, or is there a need for amendments so that it can be inclusive? Thank you, yeah. thank you. All right, what a wonderful question, short to the point. Um, I'm going to give both um, our speakers uh, an opportunity to respond. And I'd like to tackle it in this way. I'm going to start with you, um, Prof. Cooper, if we can do that. If you've got some thoughts on the questions that have been posed, and then I'm going to end with you then, uh, Prof. Janine, and if you can uh, use it as well as an opportunity for closing remarks. The social media era in which we are in, the technological revolution, whilst we've noted its drawbacks, can still be utilized to spread messages of hope, of coming together, of sharing. Because without sharing those stories that people clearly are impacted by, and we've seen them in the last couple of years, we're not going to 
be able to create our own platforms. So I, I don't think we have that opportunity. And that's, that's part of the difficulty. So we need to be redirecting those platforms as an easy way out un unless we have other platforms that come out of our own societies and we know what's happened with certain things that have been taken over by big uh, corporations. The issue of reviewing where we're at, it's always good for a society to constantly review where we're at and not accept that which has failed. We have reached a stage where by being compliant and by putting faith in those persons who said, we liberated you, we end up actually being worse off than we've ever been in our recent history. So we need to reassess what we do and what Janine has suggested, and that is one, one brick at a time, one person at a time. We can do better than that because we, we belong to small and larger groups and we can start engaging on those issues and find common cause. What has brought us to this place is a very narrow sectarianism, a very narrow approach to issues, and we're still looking for the resurrection of failed structures. It's now time to go beyond that and to look beyond the limited politics that unfortunately has tended to blight our future. So thank you for the, these questions. Um, you're right, they are related uh, somehow. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, sharing the stories, technology actually, we should embrace it. We don't have to do one thing or the other. We can combine. You can go back and re collect those stories from the grandparents before we lose them. Collect them, bring them. How do you share them? Using technology, right? So we have, I see phones all the time. Collect, share those stories with the tools that we have today. They, we shouldn't take it as uh, technology is foreign to us, therefore. No, let's take it. All the tools we can have, let's use them. So I would definitely say technology shouldn't limit us. And in fact, it's going to allow us to collect even more than we could, even, even if we didn't have this Western technology. So anything that's positive, I take. That's really how I, I operate. So we take those tools, let's use them for us, let's use them to, call, to tell our stories. And telling our stories, where do these stories end up? So we don't want the stories to just be sitting somewhere on someone's laptop, on a drive. We want those stories to go back, feed the curriculum, feed education, feed workshops, feed whenever there is room, an opportunity to learn, let's use base our, our our, our, what we teach, our, our young people teach using those stories. So that's what I would say. No matter how far they can go, let's, we're many, right? We can share tasks, and you go each one by one, we can build it all together and tell our own story. And in the end, it will be the story of us who have been oppressed rather than the story of the winner, of the, the, the oppressor. Okay, so then I'm going to add one more thing about building bridges across um, uh, African nations. Yes, we can. It doesn't mean that we will be perfect. We will make mistakes, and we can correct them as we go. Every system, I don't think there'll be a system here on earth that's going to be perfect, but we keep working at it. So yes, people made mistakes, they correct them, and we keep doing it. Just remember how our elders did it in the village. If someone made a mistake, they brought him in the circle, and they, taught, they helped him grow up, come back to serve, to be a member of the community. So, and I think that's the best way to do it. Um, 
And does the system work for uh, black people? Uh, the, the system that we have, well, it may, not, it may not be working, but that's the time you reassess, like you just said. We continue to assess. When we create a curriculum for teaching, if we don't assess, we won't know what's working and what's not working. We assess, we go back to the conversations, to the table, and talk about it, right? Talk about it, rather than dividing instantly. That's why. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's not my place to thank uh, the speakers today. I am going to invite Uputsimpiwe uh, Hashe, who is the national chairperson of Azapo, to do the official thank yous um, for today. Thank you very much, uh, Nobu. Um, and thanks to every one of you for making the time and come to listen to this because story. It is because story and it is our story. It was great to see all of you so connected to what uh, Professor uh, Jinin uh, was giving us today. She's been asking us to listen to ourselves and tell our stories, but tell our stories in a manner that makes us understand who we are, asking the question, who are we? But that question needs to be answered in a very authentic way, Janine, because authenticity defines who we should be. Thank you for asking us the question that was asked by Professor Cooper in 1968. Because when they met with Biko, they asked the question, who are we? And that is the question that we continue to ask. And so we are here to thank you for forcing us back into that conversation of asking the question, who are we? So that we can begin to define ourselves in the manner that we so choose. So we thank you for giving us your thought provoking input today. I also want to thank uh, Professor Seth Cooper for the response that he gave to your talk, but more than that, for helping us memorialize Biko and for helping us craft a philosophy along with Biko that helped us to define ourselves as we see ourselves. So thank you for keeping uh, the name of Bigo alive and thank you for your response and for agreeing to be part of this program today. But I also want to thank, um, you know, Professor Mutua. We have been on this journey together for a couple of years now. And um, I, I feel great to be part of the family. Azapo feels good to have partnered with the university, Nelson Mandela University, over the years. And this being the 12th year that we have been together on this journey, may it continue. Thank you very much for honoring this. I, I also want to thank the gentleman that I have been working with, Alan Zil. I do know that he doesn't want to be acknowledged, but I do want to acknowledge his contribution with Conrad largely because this is his last lecture with us. I understand that uh, he is retired by the university and uh, he is moving on with his life. So uh, with him uh, making way for somebody else to come, Professor Mutua promised me that uh, the Azapo Nelson Mandela University partnership will continue and the Biko lecture will continue beyond uh, today. Thank you for that commitment. And lastly, I, I, I do want to thank two individuals who have made a sterling contribution to, to this program. The, the first one I want to talk to is a gentleman by the name Simpiwe Sizi. 
Some of you may know him because he was part of the Azanian Students Convention here at the university some time back. And he approached the branch of the university to ask the university to start a lecture on Vigo. And that was 12 years ago. And when the branch of Azasco here um, was spoken to, they felt uh, uh, it is bigger than them. They needed uh, to take this to Azapo, and they did. And they brought it to our attention, and here we are 12 years later. For those of you who do not know who he is, Simpua is a, it's not me, I'm Sizi. He is a heritage practitioner and a BC activist. And he calls himself an advocate of Steve Biko's ideas and an egalitarian of note who fights uh, for that society post-oppression. And he's also a founder and director of Ezinganjini African Heritage Foundation. And the foundation's focus is really around heritage con conservation in South Africa, especially the liberation heritage. He is also interested in building interest on young people to get involved in learning more about South African liberation heritage history, as well as uh, research mainly on African identities post-colonial post era. He is also a member of the Mandela Bay Heritage Trust, a Cultural and Creative Industries Federation of South Africa, as well as the Nelson Mandela Bay Heritage Sector. He is of course, uh, studying towards uh, his uh, master's uh, at UCT on conservation in the built uh, heritage. So he has been working uh, as an advocate for Steve Biko's uh, sites in the Eastern Cape, uh, on, more especially on the eastern side of the Eastern Cape to be declared heritage sites, as well as uh, to be an excursion uh, for school youth um, of Kabeha in the Eastern Cape and abroad and he's also involved in the proper management of heritage sites in Kabeha, joining hands with um, local heritage bodies and as well as municipalities in achieving that. May I call on uh, Simpiwa to join us on stage? So as it does, so I'm going to ask the prof to hand over a small gift of appreciation for the work that we have done. Yeah, some people come, come, come. Yes. I'm going to ask you to, to, yeah, to, to wait there and also the prof not to disappear because I have another special acknowledgement uh, that I want to, you to give. Uh, the, the next acknowledgement is really to, to Lele too. You, you, you saw her and you've heard and you've listened to her. Uh, Lele too is one individual who has been with us since the beginning of this because commemorative uh, program. Leletu is a native of uh, the city. Uh, you, you, know, you know her as a poetic soul, which was first heeded to her calling for poetry in 2003, and driven by her desire to empower women and girl children in schools. Poetic soul began her career by launching and showcasing her talent as an underground poet in her hometown. Her talent and drive have seen her blossom into a recognizable brand within the Eastern Cape. She has performed alongside the greats of South Africa's vocal power, such as Lebu Mashile, Mek Manaka, and Swongile Kumalo. Her attention and establishment into poetry began a journey that led to the launch of her debut album titled It Is Ours, and that was in 2015. In 2013, Poetic Soul lost her eyesight completely, and despite the anticipated and obvious challenges that come with the sudden loss of visual senses, she holds the belief that everything happening is a hint for how life prepares you for the next dimension. 
Her early discipline in journal keeping, coupled with a razor sharp memory, have shaped her in ways she could not have expected. Driving has been the foremost thing that she misses the most uh, these days when she was uh, visually able. But Leletu is nonetheless assertive that she can do what most visually able persons can. She says, I'm just a girl, a very happy girl. Today she dazzles audiences with each presenting opportunity, having had an impromptu performance alongside Simpuwe Dana in May 2015. And this performance served as a launching pad for an invitation to perform later that month in Johannesburg along um, notable poets like Mzwa Kembuli, Mek Manaka, Pops uh, Muhammad at the closing of the Africa Month Night of the Poet event. As a result of the exposure and subsequent privileges catapulted by her creativity and flair, Poetic Soul is now a blossoming businesswoman and community developer. Her love for poetry and passion for Isi Closer and her an opportunity to work with the Nelson Mandela University offering and uh, teaching performance uh, poetry to high school learners between 2014 to 2016 with a focus on the development of Isi Closer. Her penchant for words and poetry shall one day culminate in her becoming a published author. May we invite her back on stage. Lastly, I, I do want to thank all of you for coming, and it's been a great evening. And um, we'll see you next year this time. Thank you very much.